Hello, the world. Today we have a little departure from our normal true crime cases. We wanted to tell you a scary story, and today's tale was written and performed by my sister, Courtney Eck. So sit back and get scared, because this is The X Files. <laughs> thought a lot about it over the years, and I still don't know if it was the sound or the sensation that woke me up that first night. I'm not sure how it could have been either, because now I know it was such a subtle and almost imperceptible pat on my comforter near my shin that woke me, like a small acorn falling from a short distance, or a half an inch of butter sliding off of a knife and landing on a tabletop. Such a small and innocuous amount of sound and weight hitting me while I slept. I do remember suddenly being fully and terrifyingly awake, as awake as I've ever been in my entire life. I laid in bed, eyes blazing wide but body perfectly stone still as my mind raced to try to understand what had ripped me from my sleep. Without moving my head, I trained my eyes down the length of my bed toward the area on my leg where I somehow knew the tiny but intentional pat had occurred. I went through all the cliché motions of trying to determine if it had been a dream or something outside of the window at the foot of my bed or my cat Toby shifting awkwardly and disturbing a toy or a doll. But there was no Toby and no sound other than the slow, painful exhalation of my breath as I begged myself to breathe, to calm down, to go back to sleep so school the next day wouldn't be dragging and awful. But my eyes scanned the bottom of the bed and my ears strained against the silence to find the source of that awful, muted pat. My leg tingled where the comforter had indented slightly and brushed my skin and shin bone. I just knew there had been something. Something hit my blanket. Something woke me up. Something wanted me awake and scared. Stop doing this to yourself, I pleaded inside my head. There's nothing. It's nothing. Just think nice thoughts and go back to sleep. Don't be all weird and stressed out and awake. You'll regret it tomorrow. I knew better than to think I could demand sleep back into my body, but somehow, miraculously, the terror and anxiety subsided to a dull enough roar that I was able to close my eyes and stop that awful scanning of the lower half of my body. Slowly my hands relaxed from the top of my comforter. Slowly my ears released their hold of the air near my head. And slowly, ever so slowly, I started to drift back to sleep. Pat. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, I screamed inside my head as my eyes snapped open and stared back at the spot. That was something, that was definitely something, I screamed to myself, no sound coming from my mouth, but my brain absolutely on fire with alertness and terror. The air reverberated ever so slightly with the sound of that nightmarish pat and my comforter seemed to hiss as it rose back into its original shape from where the indent had landed just above my left shin. What the fuck was that? I wondered as my vision blurred, my eyes beginning to fill with tears. What is happening? Why am I so scared? I was only 13 that first night, but there hadn't been many days or nights previous that anxiety hadn't flooded my body on some level. There were minor floods, like laying awake trying to figure out how I'd avoid the gaze and ridicule of Amber and Natalie in my home room when my mom demanded I'd wear the weird jumper she'd made me during one of her creative bursts. To massive, crushing floods as my brain chose the middle of the night to process the knowledge that my family might be in some financial trouble. Mom hadn't outright said we were in trouble over the years, but I was bright enough to pick up on imperceptible cues and read between the lines that every couple of months my dad would fuck up and overspend on silly things like a rare fishing rod or an expensive cut of meat and it would throw our razor's thin budget off for several weeks and I'd be left wide awake and practically vibrating with the stress of knowing that our life could tumble down at any moment when there wasn't a single thing my teen self could do about it. So many agonizing nights spent wondering what would happen if the mortgage on our modest home was paid too late or the car broke down again and there wasn't enough to get it running to get my parents to work. But this was not that. This was blinding, all-consuming fear. This was teenage me staring down my small body at the spot of my leg where something had twice now left a pat. 
that had alerted some primal, awful part of my brain that I was in unbelievable danger. I managed to inch a hand to my eyes and swipe the tears away enough to see clearly. My eye adjusted to the dark enough that I could make out the tiny stupid flower in the pattern on the comforter where the pat would have landed. I was at least five years too old for the babyish pattern on my blanket and pillows, but far too concerned about my parents' perilous finances to ever ask for an upgrade. I hated those fucking flowers, and a new resentment began to rise in my throat as I stared at the one, begging it to explain to me what was happening, to offer some comfort through its dumb illustration of a puffy white flower, better suited for a young girl's dress at the turn of the century, or the dining set of someone with outdated and questionable taste. The flower offered no answers, and I was so desperate to find a home for my ever-increasing terror that I half expected it to begin to expand and form a puffy, awful mouth and consume me as I lay paralyzed in my bed staring into its cottony abyss. It would be a relief, I decided, to allow the soft and awful darkness of the flower's make-believe mouth to engulf me and take me away from this fear. But instead of the poorly printed flower growing a mouth to consume me, Something much, much more awful happened. Just before my vision would have blurred again from staring at the spot so intensely, a long, skinny shadow emerged over the area my eyes were fixated on. I quickly marveled at the fact that a shadow could be cast in such a dark room, but reasoned that my vision had adjusted just enough to perceive the subtle shift, and I snapped my eyes to the source. I think my brain broke in this moment. I can't be sure. Maybe it was the accumulation of the other nights, but something shifted deep, deep inside me as I looked up. Something that could never come back, never in all the years that stretched out before me, or all the years beyond that. Down at the end of my bed was the worst thing I have ever seen. A horribly long, overly jointed, pale and pasty, slightly shiny, fucking finger. It was a fucking finger. It hovered at the edge of my bed, stretching at least eleven inches, and its presence was unlike anything I ever could have conjured in a nightmare. That long, hideous, evil finger, hovering at the end of my bed, taunting my sanity and ambiguous in its intention. I've thought a lot over the years about why I didn't scream. Why I never, ever screamed. Why that, instead of waking mom and dad and my eight-year-old sister and everyone in the neighborhood and in the goddamn world for that matter, why I just laid there and stared and allowed my mind and soul to rearrange itself into something new. Something that could accept that there was a finger, the length of a water bottle, suspended in the middle of some psychotic action at the foot of my fucking bed. I could have screamed and my parents would have rushed in slightly out of it in their typical fashion but loving and protective, and they would have thrown on the lights and thrown back the cover and revealed the source of the gruesome finger and saved me from this moment. But I didn't. I didn't scream because I was good. Perfectly, oppressively, endlessly good. It was the thing people commented most about me, how good I was. It was the thing people liked the most about my parents, too. She's so good, they all said. My teachers, my babysitters, people at the church that we attended enough to seem like the right kind of people, but not frequently enough that I ever felt comfortable there. I was a capital G good kid, and so I didn't scream. I never screamed. I just stared at that vile thing and allowed it to wield its invisible power and change me in an instant. When I think about the scariest part of it all, it's just how quickly a person can completely change. How you can live one life for so many years and in just an instant that life is gone. Your grip is gone. Your previous brain and perspective is gone. And in its place is a pink, fleshy, useless thing that forever scans for the awful, evil thing you can't see but you know is there. It's always there. Why is it there? I have no idea how long I stared at the finger. I know it was just a few minutes probably because it was still dark outside when it finally broke the thick tension between my eyes and its lanky horror and in an instant, the entire angular length of it bent in far too many places for my brain to comprehend and with the swiftness of a scorpion, it arched over and with intense restraint, the tip swooped toward my leg and landed a single swift pat. And before the pink fleshy thing inside my skull had time to react or recoil, it was gone. It just tapped my leg with that dreadful, dull, packed, 
and then disappeared behind my bed. I didn't go back to sleep that night or for many, many nights after, but we'll get to that. I laid there until the sun came up, trying unsuccessfully to hold the edges of my world together and absolutely trembling with the anticipation of the finger reappearing. What was happening? What was this thing? What did it want? How was I supposed to go into the world like nothing had happened, smiling and nodding and participating and taking care of everyone and everything in my life like the capital G good kid that I was? But I did. When my alarm went off, I got out of bed and into the shower. I soothed my bloodshot eyes with Visine and went through the motions of eating the toast my dad prepared for me, even though the act of chewing and swallowing the barely buttered toast was nothing short of torture. I went to school, and that's where the real horror struck. I was going to have to live this life knowing what I now knew, knowing that there is a thing that is not of this world but lives in this world that can find me and terrorize me and rip open my brain in the deepest part of the night, and I have to continue to live like everything's fine. By the time I got home that day, I felt like there was a high-pitched scream reverberating in every cell of my body, and I couldn't let it out. I felt like I'd been taken apart and put back together into a gruesome, imbalanced approximation of the girl I'd been just hours before. It was a living nightmare. It was actual hell. I didn't sleep that night, or the next, or the next, or the next. The finger didn't return, but my fear still grew. It wasn't just about my fear of the finger appearing, which I was mind-shatteringly terrified of. It's what the finger's presence meant. And I couldn't wrap my mind around what it could possibly mean, and so my pink, mushy, useless brain whirred a million miles an hour trying to understand, and so I never slept. I only slept when my mother finally took me to the doctor after I almost stabbed my sister while trying to help my parents make a salad when I lapsed into what the doctor said was, quote, microsleep and essentially blacked out for a full minute. He gave me some medication which allowed me to sleep enough to not die, but not enough to ever feel normal again. But I knew I'd never feel normal again, even if I could sleep. It was three months before the finger came back. I'd just started to feel like it maybe had been a dream or a weird hallucination. I'd read about people hallucinating because of mold or allergies and was beginning to think that I just thought I'd seen the finger because I'd eaten something bad or my bedroom had bad ventilation. Then one night, three months later, I jolted awake very suddenly around 3 a.m., absolutely paralyzed with an inhumane fear. Once again, my eyes snapped open, but my body remained still, too afraid to move and completely unable to process why I was so fucking afraid. And just two seconds after I awoke, there was an excruciating, dull pat. And there it was, crooked and hideous and evil. I knew it was evil with everything inside of me, and it hovered for just a moment, then it slipped horribly behind my bed. The next day started the unendurable process of living life outside of life all over. But this time there was no sweet temporary relief in thinking it had just been a nightmare or an allergic reaction. The finger came back the next night, and the next, and the next, tormenting me into a state of total permanent panic for months. Starting the day every day was just as bad, if not worse, but I was still a capital G good kid, and so did what I was supposed to do, and diligently took my sleeping pills to hang on to some semblance of sanity, and not worry my parents too much, even though my world wasn't just splitting at the seams, it was absolutely shredded. Eventually I got a night or two off, and then sometimes a week or a month, but it always came back, and along with it the searing panic and fear wrapping tighter and tighter around my stomach and brain, and eventually suffocating rational thought and real emotion and reason. My ability to be good was the only thing that remained intact and propelled me forward for just over a year, but eventually the lack of sleep and slipping sanity became too great, and others started to notice that there was something capital W wrong with me. My desire to be good kept me from ever disclosing what was going on, from ever letting anyone in on my dire ordeal. How could I do that to someone else? How could I risk ruining the world of someone I loved, of unleashing something so horrific on someone else? I just let them think that I was going regular old crazy, that my mental health was failing me, and one day they brought me to the hospital for a few days, and then a few more, and eventually I never left. 
At first, I'll admit, I held out hope that it couldn't find me here, but of course that thought was stupid. Of course it found me here. The drugs are stronger here, but they don't save my pink, mushy brain from still knowing that it's in the room just seconds before it lands a dull but utterly destructive pat on my leg. It's been seven years, and it's visited me almost every night for the last three. You'd think I'd be used to it now, but I'm not scared of its presence. I'm scared of what's coming. The strange torment isn't what it wants. I know there is something much, much worse coming. I've known it since the first night. Well, maybe the second, but I've known it for seven years, and this isn't it. The disgusting nightly taps on my leg are just the warm-up. I'm amazed that my brain hasn't completely imploded from the fear and anticipation of what's coming, but maybe the curiosity of what that could possibly be is the only thing keeping me here at all. Every night I awake to my nerves on fire from fear. Every night I feel and hear that sickeningly dull and ugly pat. And every night I wonder if it's finally going to do what it came here to do, and it hasn't yet. But it will. God help me. It will.